Joseph James D'Angelo has been called a lot of things by law enforcement. He's been called the East Side Rapist. He's been called the Visalia Ransacker, the original Night Stalker, and the Golden State Killer. Today, it's our pleasure to call him Defendant. skrev Michelle McNamara i sin bok I'll Be Gone in the Dark En dag snart så kommer du att höra en bil som kör upp utanför ditt hus och hur motorn stannar. Du kommer att höra fotstegen som går fram till din dörr som de gjorde för Edward Wayne Edwards 29 år efter att han dödade Timothy Hack och Kelly Drew i Sullivan, Wisconsin. Som de gjorde för Kenneth Lee Hicks 30 år efter att han dödade Lori Billingsley i Aloha, Oregon. Klockan kommer att ringa på dörren. Det finns inga små sidogrindar ute ur trädgården. Du är för gammal för att hoppa över ett staket. Du andas djupt. Du biter upp tänderna. Men det här är slutet för dig. Du sa. Du kommer att vara tyst för alltid. Och jag kommer att försvinna i mörkret. Men så är det inte. Öppna dörren och visa ditt ansikte. Och gå in i ljuset. Michelle McNamara dog under sitt arbete med att skriva boken All Be Gone in the Dark om Erons. Och så här tweetade hennes man Patton Oswalt. Godnatt Michelle, du gjorde ett bra jobb. Du riktade ljuset och hjälpte jägarna att fånga ett monster. Erons är fast. Joseph James D'Angelo var Erons. De har en 100% DNA-match- det har hållits en presskonferens. Taskforcen som bildades då som jag pratade om i Erons Stilett gjorde sitt jobb och tog honom. Jag kommer förstås att göra inte bara ett avsnitt om Josef D'Angelo, Erons del 11 då, utan flera stycken. Jag kommer följa rättegången och det kommer att bli flera stycken avsnitt. Jag är så rörd nu så att jag... I alla fall... Jag måste ha mer korrekt information först och utredningen pågår ju fortfarande så att givetvis kan vi inte kan vi inte säga för mycket saker klart. Det finns en massa rykten just nu men det verkar som, så jag ska säga några saker nu med reservation då för att jag har fel. Utredningen, alltså de fick, ett, de fick upp spåret av Josef till Angelo sex dagar innan idag. Han fanns inte på någon rad. Han var inte misstänkt. Carol Daly, den här polisen som tog hand om alla våldtäktsoffren i Sacramento. Hon sa att hon kände till Joseph James D'Angelo alls. Varken som misstänkt eller som offer. Eller säga, eller som polis. Men de hittade honom på något sätt. De plockade upp någonting han hade slängt. Och tog hans DNA från den och fick den 100% match. Och de hade indikationer på att Joseph James D'Angelo som alltså bodde i en typisk Eons villa i Citrus Heights. Precis utanför. Eller precis ja, i närheten av Rancho Cordova helt enkelt. De fick indikationer på att han skulle... Ja... Göra någonting om han visste att polisen var på väg. Och han hade massor av vapen. Så att de tog honom när han gick ut från sitt hus då. Och han blev fullständigt överraskad och lyckades inte göra någon motstånd. Men poliserna som tog honom sa att det såg ut som att han hade en plan. Och att han tänkte efter sig. Hur ska jag göra nu då? Men han är fast. Och vi vet också att han är Visalia Ransacker. Han verkar ha bott i Exeter utanför Visalia- under åren 73-76 och sen har bott i Auburn 76-79 utanför Sacramento. 
Och eh, i Auburn så jobbar han alltså som polis. Han jobbar som polis i Exeter också. Men han får sparken från polisen 1979 för att han snappade en hammare och hundspray. Det kan ju förklara lukten och det kan förklara varför han kunde ja, hantera hundar så bra. Men efter att han fått sparken som polis i Auburn då, så började han mörda i södra Kalifornien. Vi vet inte än vad hans koppling till södra Kalifornien var. För när de tog honom så var det alltså i Citrus Heights där han hade bott i 20 år då sedan 90-talet. I Sacramento i princip. Hans grannar har uttalat sig men det kanske är små detaljer vi inte behöver ta upp än. Han har tre döttrar och är skild från sin hustru sedan 1991. Och han var tidigare förlovad med en Bonnie. Så jag hatar dig Bonnie. Det hade en förklaring. Två av döttrarna verkar vara födda 1981 och 1986. Så det verkar vara precis som i BTK och Hagamannen att Josef James D'Angelo slutade mörda helt enkelt för att han inte hade tid. Han var tvungen att hantera småbarn och uppfostra dem. Han bodde vid tillfället när polisen tog honom nu alltså med sin dotter och sin dotterdotter. Jane Carson Sandler var alltså offer nummer fem jag tog upp henne i podden. Hon, hon har ju varit väldigt aktiv och med poddar och ja, gå på CrimeCon och prata om det här fallet. Och när hon fick reda på att Josef James Dandelow var arresterad och är i Aron så sa hon Jag fick reda på det den här morgonen. Jag är överväldigad av glädje och jag, jag har bara gråtit hela dagen. Det är svårt att säga hur jag känner men efter 42 år, wow! Jag kommer att avsluta det här med presskonferensen. Jag ville sagt bara göra en snabb uppdatering här så att ni, ni får någon ny information. Men Aron ser fast... Och seriemördarpodden kommer att berätta hela historien om Joseph James D'Angelo. Jag spelar in det här på min mobil. Jag är inte alls i studion men jag ville få ut någonting fort. Och jag, ja, det kommer mera avsnitt. Och vi, det har varit otroligt roligt att fira det här med er på Facebook. Det har varit Facebook-sidan för seriemördarpodden har aldrig varit så aktiv som den var, har varit de senaste ja. 17 timmarna. Jag drömde hela natten om Erons. Det slutade med att jag hade ihjäl honom. Men sen när jag vaknade så vågade jag inte riktigt öppna ögonen för jag tänkte nu står han där vid sängen. Men det gjorde han ju inte. För han är fast. Det var några fantastiska citat under ja ni hörde ju redan det där Defendant citatet men Bruce Harrington, alltså brodern till han som blev mördad, han som har genomdrivit den här DNA-lagen som jag berättade om, han sa att till alla kvinnliga offer då att ni behöver inte vara rädda längre för han kommer inte, han kommer inte att komma in genom fönstret för han är fast och han är historia. For over 40 years, countless victims have waited for justice. Over these years, hundreds of individuals have sought justice for these victims and their families. Many have dedicated their virtual entire professions to seeking this answer. For many of us, it was more than a professional commitment. It became personal for many of us. For me... Here in Sacramento County, in June of 1976, I was 12. I grew up in the east area of Sacramento, near the cluster of where these crimes began. My sisters ranged from 10 to 16 at the time. As I have said many times over the last 18 years, at least for me, for us here in Sacramento, it was a time of innocence in 1976. No one locked their doors. Kids rode their bikes to school. Parents let their children play outside. The only thing we were told as a family was you just needed to be home before dark. We did not have things like cell phones or social media. And then for all of us here in this community that lived in this community during this time, it all changed. 
for anyone that lived here in this community here in Sacramento, the memories are very vivid. You can ask anyone that grew up here. Everyone has a story. But it must be remembered that it was not just Sacramento, that this de- this case deeply affected this entire state. And then in June of 2016, at the 40th anniversary for the beginning of this series, the East Area Rapist, a press conference was held here in Sacramento, hosted by the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department and the FBI, attended by many agencies across California that have dedicated their careers and professions to coming to some kind of answer. The message was clear in 2016. The magnitude of this case demanded that it be solved. There were upwards of 50 rapes, 12 murders, crimes that spanned 10 years across at least 10 different counties northern, central, and southern California. And it was that day in June of 2016 that we, in public safety, reiterated our commitment to the victims and to justice. In this case, the East Area Rapist, the Golden State Killer. And it was that day that we embarked upon what I call our journey for justice. A journey by people across borders, across all professions, police officers, FBI agents, crime lab employees, victim advocates, prosecutors, community leaders, elected officials, all with one mission, to find the answer, to give victims a voice, and ultimately to identify this person and bring him to justice. We brought together, we brought teams together not long after that press conference. We dedicated more resources, more people, and we created what I have called Team Justice, an incredible collaboration of individuals with one mission. There are things about that journey and that commitment that each of us knew. The answer was and always was going to be in the DNA. We knew we could and should solve it using the most innovative DNA technology available at this time. We all knew that it would take passion. We all knew that it would take persistence. Last Wednesday at 8.15 in the evening, I received an email from the daughter of Sherry Domingo, who was murdered in Southern California. Her name is Debbie. She was 15 at the time. Last Wednesday, she emailed, in essence, I'm going to paraphrase, Hi, Anne Marie. I thought the editing for the recent documentary was brilliant. She quoted from the show, quote, This case will be solved because of sheer persistence. She went on to say, I have those words posted in a few places in my home and my workplace, so I can see them at various times throughout the day. Thank you for that persistence. I have faith. We all knew as part of this team that we were looking for a needle in a haystack, but we also all knew that the needle was there. In the last six days, and I emphasize the last six days, that passion, that persistence, and the knowledge finally came to an answer in this building behind us here, our crime lab. Crime lab employees, DNA analysts who worked tirelessly in the last few days to provide that answer. Yesterday, an arrest warrant was issued, a complaint was filed, charging that individual with two counts of murder with special circumstances for the murder of Brian and Katie Maggiore here in Sacramento in February 1978. It is fitting that today 
is National DNA Day. We found the needle in the haystack, and it was right here in Sacramento. And with that, I would like to introduce our Sheriff, Scott Jones. Good afternoon. Before I talk a little bit about this case, I'd like to make just a couple preliminary comments. Um, When I became sheriff in Sacramento in 2010, there were very few outstanding cases that drew the passion and the interest and the dogged determination to solve as the East Area Rapist. The sheriff that I took over from, Sheriff John McGinnis, who's here with us today, told me about the importance of it. And I don't know that I fully appreciated it at that time, but I can tell you that without exception, weekly and sometimes more, I get telephone calls or emails to this day from former employees, former detectives, community members from all over this country that believe that they know or at least have some information on who the East Area Rapist was. I committed then to do everything that I could to solve it and had a lot of conversations early on with District Attorney Schubert about how we could do it. And those discussions really touched the passion of both of us to solve this case. Both of us committed the best and the brightest, our hand-picked folks, to oversee the resolution of this case and gave virtually unlimited resources and freedom to pursue whatever leads and technology currently existed. So I can tell you that over the last few days, as information started to point towards this individual, we started some surveillance We were able to get some discarded DNA, and we were able to confirm what we thought we already knew, that we had our man. And yesterday afternoon, in a perfectly executed arrest, my detectives arrested James Joseph D'Angelo, 72 years old, living in Citrus Heights. I can tell you that although it was DNA, ultimately, that led us down the right road, there were a lot of places that road could have led. I don't want to underscore, I can't underscore enough the absolute human factor, the dogged determination of not only the detectives working on this case, but the passion of the district attorney, myself, the community, and the victims. All too often we forget about talking about the victims. And today we at least brought the first step towards closure for those victims of these horrendous crimes. So I want to thank not only the district attorney and the crime lab and the DNA that helped us get here, but my own detectives and the detectives from all of these folks represented by the the leaders standing behind me when we put together this working group two years ago and brought in the FBI who was more than happy to be part of this team and effort. We had no way of knowing that we'd be standing here talking about the resolution of all of these crimes. So I have to thank them and again underscore the importance of the human factor and the dogged determination and passion of the individuals and human beings that led us down the right road to this individual today. I want to now introduce the District Attorney of Ventura County, Ventura County, Mr. Greg Totten. Good morning. I'm very pleased to announce that this morning in Ventura County, we have filed capital murder charges against Mr. D'Angelo for the March 1980 murders of Lyman and Charlene Smith. Our complaint alleges two counts of first degree murder with three special circumstances, namely multiple murders, murder during the commission of a rape, and murder during the commission of a burglary. Now, while this filing is just the beginning of the prosecution of Mr. D'Angelo, it is the culmination of a decades-long, unrelenting investigation that's singularly focused on bringing this rapist and killer to justice. The arrest and charging of D'Angelo, frankly, would not have been possible without the visionary and innovative leadership of my friend, Sacramento District Attorney Anne-Marie Schubert. 
And I want to thank her for doing such a wonderful job in this effort. She had the foresight to put together a statewide task force of, as the sheriff mentioned, some of the best and brightest law enforcement professionals in the country. I also want to thank Sheriff Scott Jones for the tremendous resources they devoted to this investigation and for the brilliantly executed apprehension of D'Angelo. I also want to thank my own sheriff's department for their great work in the crime lab and in the investigation, as well as the Ventura Police Department, which was the original investigation, investigating agency of the Lyman and Charlene Smith murder. This 1980 murder has long been a source of fear and angst uh, in the neighborhood in which it occurred, in the community, and indeed throughout all of Ventura County. This is a case that, much like the rapes that occurred here in the Sacramento area, literally struck terror in the hearts of Ventura County residents. It also, as we know, was a source of great frustration for law enforcement over a prolonged period of time. In fact, this murder was among the first cases I was ever assigned to work on as a young law clerk in the district attorney's office in 1981. At that time, we had no idea that this killer was connected to so many other crimes. But thankfully, with the advent of DNA in the late 1980s, our understanding of this case, its depth, its complexity, its geographic reach, and the sheer scope of violent crimes changed forever. We recognized at that time we were dealing with a serial killer. And at that time, at a time when law enforcement is unfortunately under so much criticism, I want the public to know that the work on this case reflects the very best, the very highest standards in the noble and dedicated and courageous police profession. The men and women of this task force de devoted incalculable hours, tens of thousands of hours, to this case. Throughout that effort, they never gave up, they never lost their resolve, they never relented, and today's announcement of charges being filed against this man, this killer, this rapist, is a direct result of their effort. And so now a new phase begins. And as we commence the charging and prosecution of D'Angelo, this too will be a team effort involving many jurisdictions working collaboratively and collectively together beyond the significant court proceedings that lie ahead and the immense investigation that is still ongo ongoing as we speak. We are committed, we are determined, and we will, God willing, hold this man fully accountable for his crimes. Thank you, and it's now my pleasure to introduce the Honorable Tony Rokakis, District Attorney of Orange County. Joseph James D'Angelo has been called a lot of things by law enforcement. He's been called the East Side Rapist. He's been called the Visalia Ransacker. The original Night Stalker and the Golden State Killer. Today, it's our pleasure to call him defendant. His 12-year reign of terror lasted from June, from uh, 1974 through May 4th of 1986. He started with ransacking, sexual assaults, rape, moved down the state from Sacramento County, and ending in Orange County. From 1980 to 1986, when he was committing his murders in Orange County, I was a member of the Orange County District Attorney's Homicide Panel 
and aware of these uns- unsolved cases and just hoping and wishing that someday we would be able to find out who this killer was. The quest to solve this case was, of course, very personal to Mr. Bruce Harrington. His brother and sister-in-law were murdered in the most god-awful way. And he worked with the Orange County District Attorney's Office and other offices to write and support an initiative that later became Proposition 69. And Prop 69 was a proposition that was uh, turned into law, and it was a proposition that uh, required uh, everybody arrested for a felony in this state and some misdemeanors uh, to give a DNA sample. And it very, very substantially increased the DNA database of, uh, of California. In Orange County, uh, still keeping this case in mind, by the way, that case was a strong um, um, incentive to work on developing this uh, this uh, uh, database, the California State Database, which now has about two million profiles in the database. Uh, and uh, the, in, in, in the meantime, uh, the Orange County District Attorney's Office started our own local DNA database, and uh, we put about 170,000 DNA profiles of individuals who committed crime in Orange County in our database. All the time, we had this case in mind eventually hoping to uh, solve this case. So we've been working vigorously together with this task force that you've been hearing about. We've been working with them for uh, since since the original meeting that uh, uh, District Attorney Anne-Marie Schubert put together here in, in Sacramento. And, uh, and Anne-Marie, I want to thank you for doing that. That was that was a it was a great uh, thing to to uh, to respark this uh, this uh, investigation to put this task force together. It was something I, I'm sure all of the different agencies uh, throughout the county who were involved uh, had the case in mind, always wanted to solve the case, worked on it uh, you know whenever they could. But with this task force, it was a concerted effort. We put resources on it. We put full time people on it. And I want to thank the people from my office, the, the people who worked tirelessly on this case, uh, to work to to uh, to attempt to solve the case. And I, I just think it's uh, um, it's wonderful that uh, that it was eventually solved in in Sacramento. And I want to take the time to uh, a little bit of time, just a moment, to recognize or remember the victims from Orange County. August nineteenth, nineteen eighty, the defendant Joseph D'Angelo is accused of brutally murdering 24-year-old Keith Harrington and 28-year-old Patrice Harrington in their Dana Point home. He's also accused of raping and sexually assaulting Patrice. On February 5, 1981, the defendant is accused of raping, sexually assaulting, and murdering 28-year-old Manuela Whithium in Irvine. Three months later, Years later, on May 4th, 1986, D'Angelo is accused of raping, sexually assaulting, and murdering 18-year-old Janelle Cruz in her home. We've always believed, at least for many years, that this case would begin and end with DNA. This defendant's been able to live free in a nice suburb in Sacramento. Our team is going to work hard to make sure that he never gets out. We're going to be working together to make determinations about what the team's going to be that tries him, where he's going to be tried, and so forth. All of those uh, things are going to be answered in, in, uh, in a short time. One other note. In 2016, myself, my office, worked very hard with uh, Ventura County District Attorney Greg Totten and with Sacramento County District Attorney Anna Marie Schubert to keep and to reform the death penalty. And that was a successful effort. It was a hard effort, but it was a successful effort. So now as we proceed forward with this case, that remains a relevant effort. So I just want to say that finally... After all these years, the haunting question 
of who committed these terrible crimes has been put to rest. Now, Mr. Bruce Harrington is here, and uh, you've heard his name. I want to introduce you to Mr. Bruce Harrington. Mr. Harrington, if you would step forward, please. Fifty-one rapes and 12 murders. Today, I'd like to speak to the multi-generation, hundreds and hundreds of multi-generational victims of this staggering crime spree. It is time for all victims to grieve and to take measure one last time to bring closure to the anguish that we've all suffered for the last 40 some odd years. It is time for the victims to begin to heal so long overdue For law enforcement, bravo, bravo, bravo. Their tenacity, their patience, their unrelenting focus. A shout out for Tony Rakakis, for Steve Cooley, for Lisa Kahn, uh, Marie Schubert, Jan Scully, Larry Poole. The names go on and we've known many, many of them over the years. Today is also a reaffirmation of the power and the public safety that's associated with forensic DNA technology. I began my quest in the mid-90s when DNA finally came of force into the world of forensic science. My brother and his wife were killed in 80. So it was 15 years until we finally heard that there was a DNA sample taken from our crime scene. And as the years rolled on, there were other DNA samples that became common to one unknown perpetrator. It's been a struggle to bring DNA and California to the forefront of that forensic crime scene investigation tool. Surprisingly, when I looked at the situation in the late 90s, California was a laggard. Virginia, Florida, some of the other more progressive states on the East Coast were light years ahead of California. I spent time in Sacramento in the early 2000s, appearing before Assembly and Senate Public Safety Committees, pleading that they embrace the power of DNA. And frankly, I ran into a buzzsaw of opposition. So in 2003, it became apparent that nothing was going to happen through Sacramento. Senator Burton and the Senate Public Safety Committee, my nemesis, I shamed you then, and I shame you now. You were wrong. DNA, what, what, what is it all about? It's a three-legged stool. The DNA with a powerful database allows the sample to be checked to against old cases, against those that have been wrongly acquitted accused against those that have been wrongly convicted and are sitting in prison. Over the years, innocence projects have flourished at law schools in particular, using DNA to try and exonerate those wrongly committed. I hope they continue. They are a robust and active part of of the harnessing of DNA technology. DNA also 
solves current crimes. This isn't a current crime, that's an old crime, but it's finally solved by DNA. DNA also looks out and cuts down on future crime by using that database to, ex to exonerate those that have been wrongly um, suspicioned and otherwise allow current crimes and to be solved efficiently. I end with a plea to the voters because we are back circulating another petition this year, right now. Go out to your Walmart, go out to your, to your markets, and you'll find people gathering signatures. There is a keep California safe proposition, just like there was the DNA Prop 69 position back in 2004. But here we now know in spring and summer of 18, filing another petition to build up, to improve, to build upon and create an even more robust DNA database in California. We need signatures. We need 500,000 signatures by mid-June. It'll be on the November ballot. Vote for it. And you're going to ask yourself, why is it that we're having to circulate a signature petition again? And I would tell you, the Burton, Burton accolades that are still controlling the public safety committees in the Assembly and the Senate, again, have disappointed their job and made a mockery of the name of their committee, the Public Safety Committee. So vote for that proposition. And again, to the entire reservoir of victims out there, my sadness is with you. For the 51 ladies who were brutally raped in this crime scene, sleep better tonight. He isn't coming through the window. He's now in jail and he's history. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Dinah Becton, District Attorney for Contra Costa County. For decades, a suspect eluded capture for so many heartbreaking cases that affected victims across California. These victims could never truly feel safe, even years after the attacks. Justice did not come swiftly as we may have liked or wanted. But now today, we will do everything that we can to bring justice to the victims that suffered from unspeakable harm from these horrific crimes. The outstanding work to bring resolution to this case was in part led by Paul Holes, who has investigated this case for over 24 years. Paul recently retired as the Chief Forensic Services Officer for the Contra Costa County District Attorney's Office and prior to that, he spent 24 years with the Contra Costa County Sheriff's Crime Lab. Paul spent decades tracking down leads, interviewing victims, and researching new technological advances. While he recently retired from the DA's office, he never gave up on bringing justice for all of these victims. And his work in using new technologies helped to solve this case. The collaboration between our office and the various law enforcement agencies across the state has now underscored how committed all of us are to finding a resolution out of a decades uh, log of old cold cases and to bring justice to victims who suffered both physical and mental pain. Their lives were forever changed. With today's welcome news, hopefully, the victims can begin to continue on the long road towards recovery as they remain resilient in the face of what happened to them. I'd like, not, like now to introduce Sean Reagan from the FBI in Sacramento. Good afternoon, everybody. Again, I'm Sean Reagan. I'm the special agent in charge of the Sacramento FBI field office. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I would just like to 
thank all of this team that's uh, that's behind me. And when we say a team, it truly is a team. Uh, you can see that multiple agencies, multiple jurisdictions across the state of California, and that doesn't include all of the leads that were followed up on in other states and in, in other jurisdictions. Uh, countless hours, as was mentioned, have gone in to this investigation. Um, and this team came together and, and worked consistently uh, to bring to bring justice uh, in this matter and to identify a subject responsible and to solve these heinous crimes. And I'd be remiss uh, when we're talking about a team if I didn't also include the public. Uh, we've reached out to the public uh, over the years uh, through media and since 2016, we've literally received thousands uh, of media or of uh, public tips. Uh, and before that, obviously, through the course of of the decades we've received tips uh, from the public. So the public and the citizens are part of this team. And I'd also like to thank all of you, the media. You have kept this investigation uh, and these crimes forefront in people's minds uh, and forefront in the public. So you are part of the team. Um, and I'd, I'd like to step back uh, and recognize the victims. My, my partners have done that. Um, we all came together, obviously, to bring justice in this case and to solve the crimes. But we came together to bring solace to the victims and to bring some resolution and relief. And we know that the pain and anguish has never subsided uh, through the years and through the decades. But hopefully, the significant action uh, and that we have taken uh, yesterday and over the last few days uh, will bring some sense of relief and some sense of comfort uh, to the many, many, many victims and, and victims' families. Let me also thank uh, and recognize the line investigators and the assistant district attorneys that are working this case across multiple jurisdictions. Uh, as far as the FBI is concerned, our Los Angeles field office, our Sacramento field office, our headquarters units, uh, behavioral analysis unit at Quantico, have all been involved in assisting uh, to work this investigation. And the countless hours that went in by, obviously, all the agencies recognized here, but the personnel, uh, agents, investigators, DAs, that uh, have, have worked tirelessly and passionately to find resolution in this case. I, I thank them uh, for what they have done uh, to finally bring closure uh, to this investigation. And, uh, and I say that, but the investigation continues. And obviously the prosecution uh, will, will just begin and continue. So we will continue. We will continue acting as a team uh, and continue uh, working on this extremely significant matter in investigation and prosecution. Thank you. I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Nancy O'Malley. She is the district attorney for Alameda County. Thank you, and good morning, or afternoon. Thank you for being here. Uh, it's so critically important to make sure that the community knows by our uh, by working with or through the media about this incredible outcome of this horrific case. I want to start by adding my thank yous to my, the other speakers, and particularly to the leadership of District Attorney Amory Schubert, who did bring us all back together two years ago all of the jurisdictions that had a case that we believed were committed by the same person. Not all of the cases had DNA, but many did. But all of the cases that we believe this individual committed are tied by either his modus operandi or by DNA. And I, like all, like all others that have spoken, are so thankful and appreciative of the work of the teams and the commitment after so many years. The last few weeks, I've been speaking quite a bit on the issue around testing sexual assault kits. There's a documentary that has just been released by, produced by Mariska Herke from Law and & Order. And that documentary talks about the significance of not testing kits and the impact that has on the victim survivors, the impact it has on society, and the impact it has on people who have been either arrested or 
uh, wrongly or uh, wrongly convicted of sexual assault crimes by using DNA to exonerate. Part of what we've been talking about is why it's so significant for us to get those kits out of the police evidence lockers and into crime labs. In 1978, in April, a woman and her partner were asleep. They woke up to this defendant standing over them with a gun. He raped, robbed, and did the, the, followed the same M.O. that he had done so many times before. That case occurred in Fremont, California, part of Alameda County. But that was not the beginning for me of this individual, this defendant. In 1977, when I was in college, I became a volunteer at a rape crisis center in Contra Costa County. And it was one of the first rape crisis centers that was created in California. And over the course of the year in 1977 to 1978, the East Area Rapist struck nine times in Contra Costa County. And I was involved as a volunteer advocate supporting those survivors through the process at that time. One of the things that led me to become a lawyer was to change the paradigm of the injustice that sexual assault and domestic violence experienced back in those days. We didn't have forensic science like DNA. We didn't have trained forensic, uh, trained investigators, committed prosecutors. When I joined the Alameda County District Attorney's Office, it was one of my goals to change that paradigm. And I've worked tirelessly since that time through legislation, through building programs, and all of the things that we, uh, that we see now. So I am particularly thankful and particularly proud to be part of this working group, to have been there in the beginning when I sat with survivors who had been assaulted by this guy, to now when we can witness him being held accountable for the crimes that he committed. There's other legislation. We've been pass passing legislation for some time around DNA, DNA collection, testing of sexual assault kits. And in 2015, then Assemblywoman Nancy Skinner, now Senator Skinner, carried legislation that I sponsored to have those rape kits taken out of the police evidence room and brought into a crime lab to be tested. That was followed up by a lot of advocacy at the national level. And so now there's over $179 million from the federal government for law enforcement to be able to have those kits tested. And this case is one example of so many, but a very stark example of why it's important to have those kits taken to the crime lab and tested. Senator Connie Leva right now is carrying a bill that I'm proud to sponsor that will require those kits to be taken out of the, the evidence rooms and brought into a crime lab. What we see is more than 40% and in some cases higher than that of a DNA profile that's taken from a forensic sexual assault kit. And those DNA profiles are being matched against the database that we just heard about. And those crimes are being solved, not just sexual assault crimes, but murder crimes like this. SB 1449 is on its way through the legislative process. And we hope and we ask the community to step up and hear their, have their voices heard that this is critical legislation to get us to a place where we can bring justice to those victims that have suffered this crime in such, an, in such a horrific way. We have brought justice to the victims and to their families in this case through this arrest and ultimately through the prosecution. Justice was delayed in this case from 1975 to 1986, but we are here now and the prosecution of this defendant will occur. Thank you for being here. And uh, I believe that, oh, let me turn it over to you. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Sergeant Sean Hampton, the spokesman for the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department. Right now, Sheriff Jones and District Attorney Anne-Marie Schubert will be answering questions 
I understand there's a lot of questions. Please be patient. There's no way we will get to them all, but we will do our best. If I can ask three interrelated questions, maybe this goes, I'm not sure which one. So you talked a little bit about the DNA collection. Apparently you targeted him. Why did you target him? More details on how you collected that DNA and what does it link it to? Is only those four crimes with which he's out that you charge, or are there others of those 177 that are out there? Um, in terms of the type of DNA, the only thing we're prepared to say at this time is that it was linked through DNA using current and innovative techniques to do that. Um, as for the other crimes that we know in California, as your list that you've been handed, there's many of them that match by DNA. It is the same DNA as those that have been charged in the Ventura case, um, as Mr. Totten mentioned. But those that they just haven't been charged yet. We just haven't gone to that point. This has happened at a very lightning speed, is what I would say. But how did you get to him? How did you know um, you him? I'm simply going to say he was identified through DNA uh, technology. Can you corroborate that there was a tip that came in to either the FBI or one of your offices last week? No, that's, that's no, that's not correct. It's not correct. No. Sheriff, can you talk about the arrest? What? Sorry. Uh, describe how that went down. He said it was a perfect. It was. Um, I can tell you, and, and obviously I'm going to have to be a bit circumspect because this is still a very active investigation. I mean, as we speak, there are warrants being served and interviews being conducted. Um, but what I can tell you is this has all happened in a very rapid uh, last few days, a, a very c compact period of time. During that time, we were able to surveil him. Um, we got a feel for some of his um, activities or lack thereof got kind of some information regarding his routines. Um, we got some information relative to what he might do if confronted or apprehended uh, based on the information we were able to glean from that surveillance. Uh, so we developed a plan uh, to wait for him to come out of his residence rather than try and approach him in the residence or when he's out, um, out and about in a, in a vehicle. Um, and so when he came out of his residence, we had a team in place that was able to take him into custody. Um, he was very surprised by that. Um, it, it looked as though he might have been searching his mind to execute a particular plan he may have had in mind. Obviously, speculation on my part, but he was not given the opportunity. It happened almost instantaneously, and he was taken into custody without without incident at all. Sergio, Sergio. So many crimes. Looking back, what was it about his demo that allowed him to uh, avoid law enforcement for as long as he did? Well, I, I can't speak to that uh, specifically, but I, I can say generally, uh, you know, until we got a working group together and were able to associate our, you know, our East, East Area Rapist with someone else's Golden uh, State Killer, uh, until we were able to collaborate and really start looking at the, the MOs, the, the manner in which he carried out his crimes and see the linkages between the crimes and the DNA that, that, that tied many of them together, um, that was a real breaking point for us and allowed us to not only get more manpower and more brain power on this case, but allowed us to get more clues and follow up on more leads. In the back. Did, did he use a hammer and dog repellent in his crimes that said that he was fired from Auburn PD for shoplifting that? Can you add to that in any way? Well, I can, I can confirm that that's the information we have at the moment. Now, obviously, part of our... Um, ongoing investigation is to kind of work backwards to try and fill in a lot of the gaps that we have about his life from then well actually from before then to now um we're aware of the same information that that you just described so um we're obviously going to be looking in to see whether that a hammer or a dog repellent played into any of the attacks but it's again i just just to reiterate it's all very very uh swift and those th those details will be investigated and meted out in the coming More days Abraham. and weeks Sure, I can tell you uh, that he is an ex-officer, a police officer in two different agencies. One in the Exeter Police Department, which is down in Visalia from approximately 1973 to 1976. Um, that was roughly during the time as the Visalia ransacker cases were occurring. I can then say that he uh, applied for and got a job with the Auburn Police Department. He was employed there from roughly uh, 1976 to 1979 uh, until he was fired for, for uh, what you just heard. Well, very possibly he was committing the crimes during the time he was employed as a peace officer. Uh, and obviously we'll be looking into whether it was actually on the job or whether it was, you know, something that 
by on the job, I assume you mean during the time he was employed, doing, yeah. I, I don't know that yet, but obviously that's a question that we're going to want to answer as well. Up front here. Thank you. Did the new book, All Be Gone in the Dark, generate any new leads in the case or help lead to the arrest? I, I'm glad you asked that question because that's a question we've gotten from literally all over the world in the last 24 hours. And the answer is no. Um, other than the fact that it, like, like uh, as was indicated, the media kept this in the public eye and kept public interest. It kept interest and tips coming in. Um, other than that, there was no uh, information extracted from that book that directly led to the, the apprehension. Sheriff, did he live at that location by himself? Any other people that residents? Does he have a family somewhere? Can you give us? He does have a family. I'm not prepared to talk about what his family is, but he does have adult children. Um, at that residence? Yeah. That, that's really all I'm prepared to say at the time. Do we know where we ended the back up right after, there? after Auburn? Do we know where we ended up after uh, Auburn Beach? Uh, we don't. We, well, we don't have a full picture yet. We're still filling in that timeline. Don't you think, Sheriff, I'd like for you to assume that you said the book didn't play a direct role, the same would apply to the age of the documentary as well. Uh, do you think that would have been helpful to the investigation? Sure, there's um, and, and again, I have to be a bit circumspect here. Sure, there's um, and again, I have to be a bit circumspect here. Sure, there's um, and again, I have to be a bit circumspect here. But when I said in my earlier comments that, you know, the DNA actually got us to a road, but the road had many destinations, possible destinations, um, I can first say that even backing up from the DNA, that we would have never got to a DNA sample or ability to, to compare it without the dogged determination of the detectives on this case. So it's not like it ultimately would have come to us anyways. That's just simply not the case. This was a, a true convergence of emerging technology and dogged determination by detectives. So once we got information that led us to a general, I mean, it's almost like the DA pointed us east so we could exclude north, west, and south, but we still had to do a lot of investigative follow-up and drill down from that direction of east until we got to this person. We did a lot of exclusions of other folks, got this person that looked like he might be uh, our guy, and then uh, we're able to get at least an initial um, discarded DNA sample that gave us uh, more confidence that this was our person and we're able to continue and get a, a better, more workable sample of DNA. It, I, I will just say at this point it was discarded DNA sample. Was it his family? Right was DNA somebody in his family who, who tested? And what does the look like for Vanity? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the question. So I, I'm, I'm absolutely certain there will be a trial. Uh, there remain questions, and I don't want to speak for the prosecution, but obviously there, there will have to be some organization as to who, who and where and, and when, but I can guarantee you, I mean, in this case, um, you know, justice was delayed. Uh, it wasn't swift, but I can assure you it will be sure. Let me just say something in terms of the prosecution. Um, there are many jurisdictions involved. I think I mentioned there's 10 counties, and so, sorry, Bob. Um, so... Those decisions are going to be made in the immediate future. This right now, as I said before, this has occurred in the last six days. And so um, we have to take time and do it right and get together and meet in the best method, as uh, District Attorney Rakakis said. So um, that will take some time. Yes, sir. Had his name ever come up before last week in any of these investigations, to your knowledge? Uh, the answer is no. You talked about the last six days. What is it that happened six days ago that really turned the tide of this investigation? I think the sheriff mentioned that a sample was collected from him, um, abandoned sample. So that's what ultimately changed the tide. And I will say this, because everybody's got questions about the DNA. Uh, the answer of, of your questions is going to come out in a timely fashion. But this case is still active. And so, you know, as much as you want to know, and I understand it, uh, we can't answer the specifics on the exact type of technology, but that will come out. All right, one more question over here. We have, I will say we have interviewed some family members without actually identifying who they are or what relationship they are. We have interviewed them, and they are as cooperative, and um, certainly uh, it's uh, quite a shock to them, as you might expect. Can I ask the DA a question? Well, we're trying to backtrack that, so we're still working on the, the actual timeline from then to now. All right, one more. Judge, Johnny. A quick question, uh, Ms. Schubert. Yes, sir. They're tied up a loose end in this long story. There had been at one point some discussion that um, the person in these cases was linked to something that happened in Australia. 
I heard that yesterday, but that's not... Do you have any information in that universe, or that's just still an open and loose end? We have no information the person's linked to Australia. So um, I think this just about wraps it up for us today. I I understand. Listen, I understand there's a lot of questions. We have a lot of work to do on the back end. There's a lot of folks behind me that have to get back to work. So... I appreciate your time. I appreciate your patience. We will try to field interviews as information comes available. And I thank you again for coming today.